Welcome to the Fundamentals of Lean and Agile Value Stream Flow Chalk Talk for NGOs and nonprofits. In this session, we're going to explore the nature of flow, the mechanics of flow, and the importance of focusing on value streams as drivers of overall organization performance and outcomes. We'll also examine the improvement and innovation journey, calling out common challenges and how to address them. In this session, we'll explore value stream flow, including a case study to demonstrate what you'll learn. In the second fundamental session, we'll explore the role of leadership, management, and management systems. And I'll share another case study from an NGO learning to put much of what we're exploring into practice. As with every session, I'll include learning tips you can pursue independently if you wish. Here's the chapter timing so you can move about easily. Before we start, I want to clarify three important points to set the stage for what you're about to learn. First, I mentioned in the introduction session that lean thinking emerged in the 1950s and has been evolving ever since with an emphasis on flow of value streams, which are the large scale value delivery engine of an organization. Agile evolved later, building on lean flow techniques during the technology acceleration era beginning in the 1990s. In this session, we're going to focus primarily on the fundamental lean process improvement methods, making note of special agile considerations along the way. I'll address specific agile methods like Kanban and Scrum in later Chalk Talk sessions, since they build on what you're going to learn here. Second, many people seem to think that innovation, the creative invention of new things, isn't a process, that it's something that happens magically. It's true that every so often, a sudden inspiration comes to each of us, sometimes in a dream or in a period of intense thought followed by sudden distraction. It's really nice when that happens, but we need innovation to be more reliable since our future depends on it. What we've learned from Agile is that the continuous flow of creation, design, and development is a process that can be taught, learned, repeated, and scaled. To prove this point, many very large and well-known companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, and hundreds of others, collectively known as internet unicorns, which began as startups and have now exceeded $1 billion in revenue, all practice some variation of Agile. For example, SpaceX is currently redefining the future of private-public partnership in space development by adopting Scrum across the entire organization, including NASA, its primary partner who has been using Agile methods on space missions for over a decade. Agile is not just for large organizations. It's safe to say most, if not all, technology development organizations of any size today practice Agile. They have to. There's no other way to keep up with such rapid change. My goal is to help NGOs adopt these practices as well. The final point I want to make is that when talking about process improvement, we'll be emphasizing problem solving in the scientific method. This is what makes process improvement repeatable and successful. Now, some people may ask, doesn't the scientific method come naturally to everyone? Yes, it does, if you were raised in a household where science was part of daily life and dinner table conversations, or perhaps if you were born with the right genes. But for most people who work in business-like organizations, I can assure you the scientific method does not usually come naturally. It can be much more of a political process, often driven by opinions and persuasion. I'm reminded of internet pioneer Jim Barksdale, CEO of Netscape, who said, if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. Now let's examine how flow works and debunk some common myths and misunderstandings along the way. Here's an outline of the topics I'll cover in this chapter. As I mentioned in the introduction, 
Flow seems like an abstract idea at first, but as you work with it, you learn how to measure it, improve it, and think about it. Flow can bring a smooth simplicity to any activity. And as I mentioned in the introduction, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, a Hungarian psychologist, spent his career defining and helping people find their flow. His work is inspiring, a mixture of philosophy and psychology supported by deep research as he applies flow in both humanistic and scientific terms to personal work and social life. In his book, Good Business, he connects the principle of flow with business social conscience, emphasizing the importance of making it possible for everyone to do their best while contributing to something greater than themselves. We're going to continue where he left off, exploring how flow contributes to high performance organizations and examining the inner workings of the process of process improvement. Here's what I mean by this circular statement. Lean and agile thinkers see most everything an organization does to provide value as a process. Processes can be continuously improved and innovated, and the way to do that is itself a process. It's not strict, rules-driven, or rigid, but flexible so it can adapt to changing circumstances. Let's briefly explore how this began. Dr. W. Edwards Deming, a statistician working under General MacArthur, was sent to Japan shortly after World War II ended to help restore their economy. He soon began coaching industrial executives on statistical quality methods and management systems, and the rest is history. In post-war Japan, there was limited industrial capacity in raw materials, with the workforce decimated by the war. Toyota was on the brink of bankruptcy in 1949, and under these conditions, they began competing with General Motors, Ford, and other global giants who were producing thousands of automobiles a day. This would seem to put Toyota at a serious disadvantage, but with that came the opportunity to, as Apple Corporation famously puts it, think differently. When mass producing thousands of autos a day, when something went wrong, a machine went slightly out of calibration, or there was a defective part, the mass producer could make thousands of bad autos before discovering the problem. If you look back at the bad old days of the U.S. auto industry, particularly the 1970s and 80s, this was more the rule than the exception. I know this for a fact because I was there in the early 80s. I went to college with many of the sons and daughters of Detroit auto workers, and I heard all the stories. Toyota led the Japanese quality revolution with a simple philosophy, working at a steady, continuous flow, making products in small batches. They maintained high quality while improving a little every day. When Toyota spotted a problem, they immediately stopped the line to fix the problem and make sure it didn't happen again. On the other hand, if a worker tried to stop the line in Detroit in those days, it did not end well for them. As compelling as this may seem, the moment we start talking about small batch production, we're likely to get strong pushback from some people. After all, aren't we losing the benefits of economies of scale? It's simple to debunk this popular myth about the advantages of mass production and economies of scale once you look closely at the assumptions. Please understand for the moment, I'll use manufacturing examples. I originally encountered lean thinking soon after it emerged in the late 1990s while I was working with enterprise software and manufacturing operations. But for the past 20 years of my career, I rarely went back into a factory. So let me be clear, these principles may have emerged and are easy to demonstrate, prove, and understand in a physical setting, but they apply to every kind of work. In general, mass production gives you the feeling of productivity, but usually without the desired outcomes. Why? First of all, mass production inherently stores large quantities of inventory at each work center so you can keep productivity up and no person or machine sits idle. 
An idle worker or machine is considered bad, so people measure productivity in terms of units of production over time. So the higher the machine or human utilization is, the better the math works out. At least the cost accountants say so. This approach to productivity is com commonly called push production because everybody is pushing to meet targets, quotas, and schedules, no matter what is piling up downstream. Just like pushing on a rope, it doesn't work that way. As inventory builds up throughput time, the time it takes for a unit to flow from beginning to end increases dramatically. A special request takes much longer to fill if you can do it at all. Because everything is designed for high volume, variation is difficult, if not impossible. Hence Henry Ford's famous remark, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. This is the opposite of agility. It's also a false economy, since you're just making more errors faster, leading to what we call failure demand, where workers are consumed with the consequences of poor quality. When you're mass producing, you don't discover a defect, you discover a bin of 100 defects. Then what do you do? Most of us have heard the tired old phrase, we never seem to have time to do it right the first time, but we always seem to have time to fix it later. Toyota learned to make cars one at a time, what we call one piece flow, or more generally, small batch production. Many lean practitioners naturally use the phrase one piece flow in every setting, not considering that some people may take it too literally. For example, years ago, I assisted a large breakfast cereal manufacturer that used an extrusion machine over 100 feet long that was supposed to produce a steady stream of nicely formed crispy flakes. It was noisy, powerful, fast, and always having problems. When the machine stopped, it needed hours for emptying, cleaning, sanitizing, reloading, priming, and recalibrating before it could be restarted. This wasted a lot of materials. And this monstrous machine stopped far too often. The majority of stoppages were caused by non-mechanical process problems such as material quality or availability, scheduling, lack of consistent user training, and so on. Over time, they improved many aspects of flow. And I can assure you they did not start making breakfast cereal one flake at a time. Thus, optimal batch size is proportional to the nature of the process, whatever it may be. The key is to start where you are and pursue batch reduction as a key to unlocking improvement. When work is flowing, you can regulate the pace of production to meet demand so you don't overproduce. And the moment you notice a problem, or better yet, signs of an imminent problem, you stop the line and fix it not just in the current task you're working on, but you make sure it doesn't happen again. This may mean you need to change something in your own work area, or perhaps you need to signal management that something has gone wrong outside the team's reach and they need their cooperation in fixing it. When you stop the line consistently, there's an accumulative effect and you find yourself spending less and less time firefighting and more time consistently doing value adding work like listening to customers and finding better ways to serve them. It's always an interesting experiment when a team estimates the percentage of their failure demand for the first time. It can be a real wake up call when they realize that what has come to feel normal is not. As they shift left, emphasizing quality earlier in the process to eliminate downstream problems, they start spending more time doing things better which leads them to doing more, better things. It's better for the organization. It's certainly better and more satisfying for the frontline employees, preparing them for a leadership role. And it's certainly better for the customers. Remember the mental health clinic example I shared in the introduction? And that was after just seven weeks. Many people remain skeptical about flow until they experience it themselves. So how do we help them do that? Well, they could roll up their sleeves and examine sophisticated mathematical queuing models. 
Does that sound like fun to them? If so, and they're the engineering-minded sort, they might consider reading Don Reinertsen's book, Introducing Lean Flow Engineering Principles to the Agile World. Or it might be fun for them to play a game. The Lean Lego game is popular in workshops around the world, helping people experience the difference for themselves. When you play the Lean Lego game, first you run through the mass production scenario, where large piles of inventory, colorful Lego blocks assembled into various things, accumulate at every work center. The pipeline is quickly clogged and throughput speed grinds to a halt. Very little finished product comes off the line, though people work frantically to beat the clock. This is full utilization at its worst. Next, you go through the flow scenario, which requires very little work and process inventory at each work center. Throughput time is very fast, meaning soon after something goes in, it comes out the other end. And people settle into a steady, comfortable pace. In case you're interested, the learning tip provides a link to a video of the entire game. This throughput problem is proven mathematically by the simple Little's Law. Imagine how a bathtub fills quickly to overflowing when the inflow rate is slightly faster than the outflow rate. Now picture in your mind a large factory filled with overflowing bathtubs, all connected together with lots of people running around mopping up the water. While this is funny to watch, it's definitely not fun to do every day. A good way to observe the advantages of flow in real life is through Kanban, which originated on the shop floor, helping to smooth the flow of materials to support quick changeovers and produce agility. Rather than huge machines hauling massive truckloads and pallets of parts to work centers in large factories, pieces were pulled in small quantities only as needed, flowing to work centers much like a river. This thinking led software developers to apply principles of Kanban in workflow and project management, where signals pull work through. A popular new phrase took off in the software world, minimum WIP, which stands for minimum work in process. What this means for any type of workflow is that you shouldn't have too many balls in the air at once. Avoid multitasking. It bogs the team down to have too much in process and they consume more time in task switching, management, reporting, status meetings, trying to figure out why things are always running behind schedule. This is the knowledge work equivalent of failure demand, managing and moving too much inventory around the shop floor. It's an enormous time suck. When Kanban and its more elaborate cousin Scrum is adopted, teams can pivot quickly in the next sprint cycle which is usually less than two weeks away. During each post sprint retrospective, they ask questions like, what's our velocity? What's the amount of throughput we can complete in the next sprint cycle? What's getting in our way and how do we remove these obstacles? And most importantly, what does our customer want most two weeks from now? There's one more important aspect of flow that I wanna mention. In any work setting, as you approach 100% utilization, whether we're talking machines or people, bad things start to happen. They burn out. They don't have time to reflect and improve, to engage in preventative maintenance, like rest or exercise, or react to changing conditions. They just have to keep running at high speed all day or else. This has harmful consequences for the organization and its people. Think about it another way. When work is flowing smoothly and pull doesn't send you a signal, but you keep producing anyway, that's the waste of overproduction. So this deeply held belief that we must stay busy all the time to be productive is not only false, but very harmful. Remember something I said earlier, that flow teams start spending more time doing things better, which leads to them doing more better things? The data clearly shows that optimal performance is achieved when you set targets around 85 to 90% utilization. People have time to think, reflect, watch, be mindful, take preventative action, 
solve problems, walk around and look at the whole process end to end and talk with each other, invest in their skills, teach and mentor others, and so on. And when someone finds themselves with spare time, they can offer to help someone else who's overloaded. Cross-skilling is valuable in a lean and agile setting because resources and capacity can flex at a moment's notice. And with a little slack, people can pivot when something does go wrong. Slack capacity is a deep subject, but trust me, there's plenty of empirical evidence in queuing theory and on real shop floors and in software development organizations. It's important for people to understand that slack time is not wasted time. It's put to best use by the people who know what needs attention at that moment. If you want to learn more or need help to persuade others not to run operations to the breaking point, read Tom DeMarco's classic Slack, Getting Past Burnout, Busy Work, and the Myth of Total Efficiency, published in 2002. So let's be clear, Lean and Agile start with a focus on quality. The additional outcomes we're looking for, speed, agility, customer satisfaction, efficiency, productivity, and lower cost, to name a few, emerge as quality improves. But wait, there's one more important outcome to consider, safety. Stop the line works in any setting, a really good example being healthcare. After all, what industry has more at stake preventing errors? How about the airline industry? In 2009, Dr. Atul Gawande, surgeon, Harvard public health professor, and leader of the World Health Organization's Safe Surgery Saves Lives Checklist Initiative, published the Checklist Manifesto. This book applies lessons learned from decades of highly successful airline industry safety practices that were derived from total quality management. Lessons learned from the airline industry emphasize the importance of capturing and analyzing every problem as quickly as possible. But it also emphasizes the importance of tracking near misses, which are far more frequent. Paying special attention to near misses turns out to be an effective early warning device for preventing serious problems later. This book has many ideas that are relevant for NGOs operating in high-risk scenarios. Once an organization decides to adopt flow, how do they do this in a safe way? Lean thinkers often talk about draining the water level of a lake bit by bit, which exposes obstacles hidden from our view. But you don't drain the water all at once. A coach will often challenge a team to try to reduce their batch size and work in process inventory by half. Sound arbitrary? It's as good as 40% or 60% until you have more data available to make an informed calculation. For starters, 50% may be close enough or whatever seems right at the time. When coaching a team forward, we shouldn't set the target too low we should take them just a little past their comfort zone, but not into the fear zone. We need to keep them safe while helping them stretch and think beyond what they know and what they think they know, safely challenging their unquestioned assumptions and deeply held mental models. Reduce your batch size by half is easy and popular as a directional challenge to be explored, challenging the team to gather data and evidence and begin formulating hypotheses to address the question, what's the obstacle that we have to overcome? Just remember when thinking about flow in your own operations, one piece flow and reduce your batch size by 50% are not to be interpreted as strict rules, but heuristics, directional guidelines. We'll discuss the important difference between rules and heuristics in a moment. Once teams experience flow, it seems natural. They've learned something important, developing new confidence to test new boundaries. They've expanded their comfort zone into new territory, and usually they don't want to go back to the old way. We've now finished what I hope is a thorough and easy way to understand how flow works using a variety of teaching methods and examples to help you grasp how it works and why it's important. 
Now let's understand how to make value stream flow in any work setting. There are many ways to visualize a value stream. For this session, we'll continue to use the simple linear model. But let me take just a moment to show you how sophisticated value stream mapping models can serve complex processes common in larger organizations. I believe this is important for everyone to see. Why? In a future quick start session on value stream mapping, I'll be focusing on frontline NGO teams, often working in remote areas around the world under difficult conditions. These are usually smaller organizations with simpler mapping needs. Recall the mental health clinic with only 15 employees that transformed their entire value stream in just seven weeks. However, these small teams often operate within the context of larger NGOs in global partnering relationships as part of a larger complex value stream where the source of their most difficult problems may originate. So it's helpful for them to understand the end-to-end -end flow so they can contribute to improving it. The purpose of a value stream map is to help the team understand their process, visualizing the obstacles, the target, and their progress towards it. So beyond all the fancy mapping techniques I'm about to show you briefly, the best maps often look like this one, created by a nursing team to depict the problems shown as the red bursts in a hospital emergency room. The traditional value stream map approach originating within Toyota was published in 1998 in the book Learning to See. This model depicts the customer pulling value, which is delivered by suppliers through a series of steps. Each step collects specific metrics used to analyze various dimensions of flow so the team can identify measure and prioritize problems. Note that the triangular icons record inventory storage points since they're the key to unlocking flow. The authors that researched and wrote this seminal book were John Shook, who was the first American manager at Toyota's operation in Japan, and Mike Rother, who later authored the book Toyota Kata, explaining their thinking process. They once mentioned that the original icon used by Toyota to illustrate inventory were little tombstones because that's where excess inventory went to die. Soon after this first book on value stream mapping, the practice started moving beyond the factory. In 2004 came another significant book, The Complete Lean Enterprise, focusing on office processes. Then in 2005 came Lean Solutions, written by Dan Jones and James Womack, who originally wrote Lean Thinking, introducing a style of mapping where the customer experience lane and the delivery lane were shown in parallel, showing how they interact, helping to visualize the problems as experienced by the customer. Then in 2013 came Value Stream Mapping, How to Visualize Work and Align Leadership for Organizational Transformation, which went beyond the mechanics of value stream analysis, connecting the practice with overall organization strategy. With the appearance of widespread digitization came a need to capture much richer information. This led to the Multidimensional Value Stream Map, or MDVSM, which was informed by business process management techniques. MDVSM builds on the customer lane approach using additional horizontal lanes to depict activities from specific business functions and partners. It also provides lanes to identify where incorrect, incomplete, unclear, or conflicting data, information, and communications cause problems. This helps create a flow-based blueprint to guide data gathering analytics, automated alerts, visualization, and to support machine learning. Whatever approach they choose that is appropriate to their situation, as the team maps their current state, they'll learn to see what's getting in their way so they can monitor these critical points to quickly spot when something bad has happened or is about to happen, or better yet, when something really good has just happened, 
so they can celebrate. Some in the lean community may feel strongly about using a particular model, especially the traditional one, but I feel that you should use whatever model best suits your requirements, adapting it to your special circumstances. I'll cover value stream mapping and analysis in more depth in a future Chalk Talk session. And as I said before, I'll produce a quick start session to help a small team independently perform their own value stream analysis using a very simple approach. It may not surprise you that before improvement efforts begin, a process is likely to be far more complicated than it needs to be. There are countless reasons why this happens. Processes break and resist improvement in a seemingly infinite number of ways. But to discover exactly what's blocking a particular process, the team must go through a rigorous root cause analysis. We're not going to dive too far into the details of this process today. I'll save that for a future quick start training session that a team can practice on their own. What I'm going to do now is help you understand what are, in my experience, the most common challenges with value streams and how to deal with them. A value stream usually crosses as many functional boundaries in an organization. For example, it may begin in sales and marketing, progress through legal, finance, engineering, production and delivery, and into customer service. Quite often, and quite naturally, people in different parts of the organization focus on their part of the process, making sure they are doing well, feeling good, and being rewarded for their efforts. They often do this by enacting rules, forms, standards, controls, stage gates, governance, meetings, supported by enormous spreadsheets and flowery PowerPoint presentations, followed by endless emails, reports, reviews, and more meetings with the hopes of reducing problems and improving the performance of their part of the process. Though they usually have good intentions and may be convinced they're doing the right thing, they're not improving the overall flow of value through the organization and to the customer. They're not removing the waste. They're just moving it around like pieces on a game board. Parts of the organization compete with each other. This predictably results in poor quality, delays, high costs, confusion, frustration, and bureaucracy. It can also cause the best employees to leave, and it certainly doesn't serve the customer. This behavior is so common that there are two words frequently used to describe it. The first is silos, where each function, department, or division sees themselves as separate from the others. Once they begin competing with each other to improve their individual performance, they're no longer optimizing end-to-end -end flow and outcomes. They're locally optimizing their own performance and thus harming or sub-optimizing the end-to-end -end flow of the value stream. Clearly, silos can become deeply entrenched in the structure, performance measurement, and culture, acting as a strong impediment to change. Now let's see how the process of process improvement is designed to address these problems in a teachable, repeatable, and scalable way. Let's say you get a cross-functional team together representing the key stakeholders of a value stream. These people may never have worked together as a team before since they've been deeply buried within their silos. Many times over the years, I've seen people in large organizations meeting for the first time in a mapping session, even though they've been working in the same value stream for years. If we're going to try to teach a group of people to dance together, we need some steps to teach them. So we're going to explore the basic dance steps of continuous process improvement held together by a simple rhythm, plan, do, check, act. This is the basic rhythm of the scientific method. PDCA was popularized by Dr. Deming. Walter Schuert at Bell Laboratories originally coined the term in 1939. But we really have Renaissance Italians to thank for teaching us how to think in this way. Galileo is considered to be the father of modern science, showing the courage to question given knowledge by some authority or assumption, to be curious, asking questions, making observations, 
in conducting experiments. Making assumptions and jumping to conclusions comes naturally to most of us, but it usually leads us astray. It was Albert Einstein who said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. The PDCA rhythm and routine keeps us from jumping to conclusions, guiding us to a steady iterative cadence, moving consistently through hypotheses towards our targets. And it's the foundation of every problem solving method you'll learn. Here are the dance steps of continuous process improvement. Many books have been written on this topic and each introduces its own variations. So please forgive me for summarizing a bit. First, this group of people, perhaps not yet thinking as a team, but at least we've gotten them all in a room together, examine the current condition of the process. Sound easy? As a facilitator of countless sessions, large and small, I can assure you it's often not, but it can be a great learning experience and very rewarding for everyone. At the beginning, it can be very confusing, sometimes with a little mistrust and finger pointing. But after a while, the whole mood starts to shift and they become a team with a shared goal. As this team unpacks its value stream, there are guaranteed to be many forehead slapping moments. You hear things like, really, I didn't know that. Why do we do it that way? Are you kidding me? And the occasional, that's really dumb. As the people in the room strip away the accumulated process scar tissue and shed some emotional baggage, they come to realize they're not competing with each other. They're all struggling with a broken process. That's when they start becoming a team when they understand that leadership has given them the opportunity to fix it. Once they have an initial understanding of the current state of the value stream, the team develops a target state, how they think the process should work. This really draws on the experience and wisdom of the collective team members to visualize what better looks like, not only based on their vision and desires, but informed by an understanding of what's really happening and what's getting in their way. When you want to improve something, you have to measure it. And here's a list of basic metrics used to analyze the improvement of a value stream. Customer satisfaction, quality, speed, and value added activity percentage. Once these metrics are in place, the team can use them to guide target setting and measure gaps between where they are and where they want to be to guide problem prioritization. And they can use these metrics to pinpoint visual alerts and notifications, flying a red flag to quickly call attention when an important process starts to tip so they can swarm the problem and prevent it from getting out of control. While these metrics may seem very simple, when a team goes through the process of understanding what's really happening, reaching a consensus on the current state of their value stream with these basic metrics, pointing out areas in most need of attention, they have made a very big step forward towards owning their process and guiding their improvement and learning journey forward. Problems that get in the team's way and impede flow are called by many names, obstacles, blockers, or simply waste. Here's a short and very incomplete list to give you some idea of the many common problems that teams may identify. In every process, obstacles may appear different from different points of view. One interesting technique when first assembling a team is to bring these differing viewpoints together is to take them on a waste walk, physically or virtually walking the process from end back to the beginning from the perspective of customer pull. It's important to help people see past preconceived ideas they may have about what is wrong since these get in the way of seeing things as they are. So the facilitator must remain objective and help the team take full advantage of what is called beginner's mind, helping them learn to see in fresh ways. It's also harmful if when launching a value stream analysis, leadership or management hands down specific goals, quotas, or mandates based on their preconceived ideas of what is wrong and how to fix it. These may reinforce the very assumptions that have gotten them in trouble in the first place. 
And in any case, they're tampering with a complex and dynamic system with potential for many unintended consequences. And perhaps worst of all, management may encourage the team to just follow the rules rather than thinking. We need teams to exercise judgment, basing their actions on evidence of what's really happening. Instead of inflexible rules to guide teams, we like to think in terms of heuristics, flexible guidelines that can be applied to each situation using judgment. A useful heuristic is VA, NVA, and NNVA. VA is something that adds value. It's value adding to the process and ultimately to the customer outcome. A team should seek to maximize the percentage of time spent on value adding activities. NVA is waste, non-value adding, an obstacle that at best does not add value and may significantly reduce value in the process, causing delays, defects, and so on. This is the primary target for elimination. Then there's the curious category of waste called NNVA, necessary but non-value adding. These are activities that don't add value, but you must keep doing them or else the process may break with serious consequences. Many controls, governance, project management, compliance, quality control, safety, and reporting activities, along with countless endless meetings, fall into this category. NNVA activities don't add any value to the customer or the product or service being delivered, other than they keep it from failing. That's a pretty low bar for value. As the process quality shifts left and the causes of failure are rigorously eliminated, the need for many of these NNVA interventions can be eliminated as well. But a team needs time, space, coaching, and leadership support to do this safely. Remember, quality first, speed comes later. Now let's take a short look under the hood at problem solving and how simple and creative visual management supports it. This is just an introduction for now. Next time you'll have an opportunity for a more extensive look at problem solving, including a full life cycle exercise. As the team identifies problems and their impacts on the end to end flow, they start to understand causality. This is where the scientific method of problem solving comes into play. In a complex and dynamic system, causality is never a straight line. For example, here's an advanced causal loop analysis of an ecological system. Note that taking any action in such a system, like ripples in a pond, may create a chain reaction of consequences, many of them unexpected and not all of them good. Unlike this ecological example, which relies solely on the logical laws of physics and nature, complex systems involving people can be far more difficult to unpack. In addition to the rules of logic, they often involve strong emotions, opinions, and agendas. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the popular scientist and author, admits that such human problems are far more difficult for scientists to grasp than the most complicated challenges in physics. When trying to make improvements in any complex and dynamic system, the team must be very rigorous in trying to understand causality. And a critical part of understanding causality is to separate causes from symptoms. Why? Because symptoms are obvious and they represent the pain we feel. So it's human nature to attack them and it feels good. But when you chase symptoms, you're just playing whack-a-mole. It's a non-value activity to expend effort trying to fix symptoms. The effort is wasted because you haven't fixed the problem and the symptoms will just appear in a different way like ripples in a pond. Finding root causes is often difficult. Sometimes this is because they're hiding in plain sight, like that elephant sitting in the room that no one feels safe talking about. Some of the most significant root causes are often beyond the reach of the team. They may be upstream in the process, caused by an outside partner, maybe they're related to policy, measurements, or rewards, or perhaps they're due to past management interventions that were intended to fix an earlier problem when in fact they only created more scar tissue. So lean thinkers spend a lot of effort on problem identification, prioritization, and solving and a wide variety of problem solving techniques have evolved to address various types of problems. 
I'll be presenting a future session dedicated to problem solving methods, but for now, let's just look at the basics. When a team begins investigating a problem, they may quickly offer explanations for why it's happening, stories they may have been telling themselves over and over. These are the preconceived ideas I warned about earlier. When they encounter such a reflexive explanation, a coach may just ask why and wait for the answer. They may do it again, perhaps a few times, sort of like a two-year-old. The five whys method can help people see that there may be something deeper going on than the story they've been telling themselves, and it can have amazing results. But be careful. Five whys is like drilling straight down, and more complex problems are like the branching roots of a tree, so unless the problem is really simple, five whys is not likely to lead directly to root causes, but it's a good icebreaker. Eventually, when the team finds what they believe may be a root cause, this is where rigorous problem solving and experimentation come in. The team forms a hypothesis, an idea of causality, and proceeds to test it. Different types of problems require different approaches. In the problem solving training and exercise coming soon, I'll dig deeply into a framework for solving four types of problems, simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. I'll also provide a hands-on exercise experience based on the popular lean problem solving approach known as the A3 method, an elaboration of the simple PDCA pattern using a single sheet of paper. Waste can easily be mistaken for regular work, and problems can often sneak up on you and take you by surprise. So let's examine an often overlooked aspect of problem solving, visualization. Visual management helps us see problems so we can eliminate them. It is both art and science, summed up in the classic phrase, making the invisible visible. Although I've spent my entire career in the technology world, I firmly believe that the best visuals are physical and not computerized, analog, not digital. Psychological and neurological studies have shown that people respond differently in a cognitively richer way to physical stimuli in their environment. Remember the rich experience of your first face-to-face -face gathering after an endless series of pandemic Zoom sessions? Take, for example, these red, yellow, and green flags you see here where someone can signal there's a problem and call for help, and it can be seen across the room instantly. Clearly, there are many reasons, such as geographically distributed teams or transactional processes that flow deep inside networks with no physical state or technology is needed. But I encourage you to keep the visuals simple at first and let the teams sort it out. Whenever possible, visuals should first be done cheaply with sticky notes, grease boards, and other simple physical devices so the team can find their way to the best solution quickly. Many times I've seen companies install a quick technology fix only to get teams stuck in a tar pit of complex technology that is not only difficult to use, but it turns, turns out not to solve the problem. And it's even more difficult to change, more scar tissue. That reminds me of a simple heuristic I learned once. Over a decade ago, I was fortunate to coach at Nike's corporate headquarters, playing a small part of a very large initiative. Years ago, Nike had adopted lean practices across their global manufacturing and supply chain operations, and they were now integrating lean and agile practice to accelerate their already world-class product creation process. In every Nike facility I visited, it struck me just how visual it was, not just in marketing and product design, but how visualization was a core part of everything they did. Perhaps the most profound thing I learned during my time there was this simple image that explained how they thought about experimentation, or play, as they often called it. Everything I saw Nike do, they tried to do quickly and just good enough to demonstrate value prove the hypothesis, and move forward. A series of rapid little steps can cover a lot of ground very quickly, and it keeps a team in a continuous learning mode. In Agile, 
Each little step is what we call an MVP, a minimum viable product. And at Nike, they quickly moved from one small step to the next. In their terms, most things were done in paper and cardboard. Very few things ever made it to wood or metal before they changed again. This is the spirit we're looking for, not just with innovation, but process improvement in general. While everyone is constantly striving for excellence, we know that we rarely reach it. And when that does happen, it's momentary. The target keeps moving and we must be comfortable moving with it. To use a sports metaphor, which was always in style at Nike, like hockey legend Wayne Gretzky said, skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. We've now reached the end of the principles and practices I'm going to share in this fundamental session. So now I'd like to bring this all together by sharing a real life experience from the for-profit world. This example is from a very large anonymous financial services company where their technology organization was charged with creating solutions for their customer sales and service teams. Technology was changing so rapidly that there was a constant demand for urgent projects and the technology was often untested. Hence, projects often took too long, cost too much, and ultimately didn't do what the customer support team wanted. The technology organization was under constant pressure to deliver and they felt many of their most urgent projects were ill-conceived and poorly designed. They insisted that they needed better quality inputs if they were to be held accountable for the results. So they put rigorous requirements definition controls in place to improve the quality of the inputs they were receiving and to ensure a project wouldn't be funded until the business case was proven. While such a step they called quality control sounded reasonable, there were in fact three basic flaws. First, with untested, unproven technology, how is the customer supposed to even know what is possible and identify a potential solution without design input from the technology strategists? Second, how do you prove something completely new will work unless you experiment with it? But every effort to design a solution and prove a business case was done with spreadsheets and PowerPoints and long meetings, implying certainty in the approach, cost, and outcomes. There was little that could be called experimentation or validation, and it wasn't safe to talk about uncertainty. Everyone spoke in terms of commitments, creating a false sense of certainty, which was then used to hold their feet to the fire when reality disrupted their bold but untested visions. This created fear and additional dysfunction. Finally, by requiring a proven business case, each proposal was subjected to political influences in the annual budgeting cycle, which usually overcommitted resources, so not everything that was approved got done that year, and many projects that were approved were then stalled for an indefinite time. This was push production on a grand scale. As a result, innovation ground to a halt. These urgent customer service projects took months of infighting and executive interventions, and many of the best ideas never made it off the drawing board, and all the time they continued falling behind the competition. Do you recognize the organization-wide failure demand here? Ultimately, the frustrated executives decided they needed to take a new approach. I was asked to assemble stakeholders from across the process in a room covered in whiteboards and colored sticky notes, and I helped them to understand the real nature of the problem they wanted to solve and define collective goals and a path forward. They shifted left. In the new process, when a new customer requirement was identified, a small team from customer service and technology engineering meet together briefly to explore the fuzzy front end of the problem, to identify potential solutions and validate their initial ideas quickly using rapid experiments. They no longer launched long, expensive, risky moonshot projects based on bold proposals and confident ideas. Instead, they started using a series of short sprints to test their ideas, quickly delivering initial solutions or MVPs that proved each hypothesis and which evolved over time, 
sprint by sprint. Their performance quickly and dramatically improved and customers noticed the difference. As an added bonus, once they understood the problem they were trying to solve, they often discovered that new technology wasn't needed at all, or not very much, just a better way of doing the work. Many people are surprised to hear that a goal of Agile isn't to write more code faster, but to write less code. But it shouldn't surprise anyone that Agile thinkers know, better than anyone, that writing unnecessary code is not only the waste of overproduction, but it's a waste of their own time and energy, which is better spent clearly understanding what the customer needs and doing only that, one step at a time. This illustrates the fundamental theme of my first book, which I published over 20 years ago. At the rapid and often chaotic pace of today's technology evolution, it feels even more relevant than it did 20 years ago that we should develop people, process, and technology in that order. I'd like to conclude this learning session with Dan Jones, who helped crack the code on Toyota's methods 30 years ago, making the principles understandable so that we can all learn how to practice lean thinking for ourselves. On the Lean Agile NGO website, you'll find an extensive interview with Dan where we explore the meaning of lean for NGOs and nonprofits. During the development of this Chalk Talk series, I shared drafts with Lean Agile NGO members to get their feedback. This included Dan, who offered to add a few thoughts on the importance of engaging people to drive improvement forward. We've all seen the gap between how systems are supposed to work and how they actually work. How work is constantly interrupted as the situation changes. Previous steps are not done correctly or on time, or machines break down. Lean thinking helps teams to respond immediately, to discover how to prevent them happening again, and eventually to design a better way of working together. By linking steps more closely to improve quality and save unnecessary time, effort and cost. So thank you for joining me. And again, if you like what you've just seen, please share it with others. Spread the word.